The Wellness Show, Episode 207. Welcome to The Wellness Show, a podcast on health and wealth. I'm your host, Tyson Bannigan, the founder of the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy. Join me as we get the latest insight, tips, and strategies from wellness providers, coaches, and successful heart-centered entrepreneurs, and much, much more. Welcome to the Wellness Show. And yet again, I'm excited. I'm always excited because I get to meet the most fantastic people on the planet. And today, we're going to talk with Kate Cat, <laughs> not Kate Cat Schultz. It's K-A-T, and she is a transformational healer who works with visionary women. And today, the topic is the next level you. So Kate, oh, Cat. Really, the one with the tail. (laughs) But with a K. Tell me, the K, (laughs) yeah, the cat with the K with no no tail. Yeah, and welcome to our last name. Our last name wrong too. It's Schulte. (laughs) Schulte. Okay. Well, other than that, other than rudely introducing this wonderful lady, so (laughs) welcome to the Wellness Show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) <laughs> I'm happy to have you here too. It's been really quite an interesting dance for some strange reason. Uh, we got pic- old pictures of you up in the market and then new pictures of you. So we've really learned how to dance together. It's been really quite interesting. Yeah. But, you know, that's what, you know, forming a new relationship is all about. We have to, you know, do the dance, go through some of the confusion to end up talking about our next level together, you and me. Yeah. So we can talk about the next level for all those listening to the show. So well, it's sort of yeah. interesting how things will unfold. So how did you end up uh, working in the area of being a transformational healer? And so I've been a healer for about a decade. Um, I knew that I, I was a healer for a really young age on, um, just from you know being around people and, and then going into the healing healthcare industry here in, um, in Canada and took my business online with coaching and healing uh, a few years ago. So that's, that's sort of like, it's not a crazy intense story. It's just, it's just really discovering that that's truly who I am and how, and what one of my gifts is, is, is healing and healing for transformation, healing for creating uh, the person in the life that you know that you want and the person that you want to be um, beyond trauma, uh, fear, shame, guilt, and uh, depression and anxiety. You know, it's that's fascinating to me because you're using exactly the same words in the lang- same language that I do working with clients as well. So that's really exciting for me because I'm curious, though, did you, was it a bit of a struggle when you were growing up? How did, how did you know that there was something more than the, the way that everybody wanted you to, to fit in? How, how did you know that there was more? Um, so I, (laughs) it's a funny story. Like, I'm sorry, there's a big, everybody, I'm very sorry. There's a giant truck outside of my office. And, um, so if you hear it, I apologize. Um, but for me, I, I, looking back, this is the funny thing. I think that for most people who are in the transformational fields, um, a lot of things happen from introspection and looking back and, and understanding that this is kind of who you are and how, who you've always been. So, I have stories of when I was a kid, I was very psychic (laughs) or, uh, you know, I grew up in a small town in small towns. There tend to be lots of trauma. I don't know why we just huddle together and are traumatized, whether it's anything from anger issues to neglect, to alcoholism, to, uh, this, that, and the other, you know, self-esteem, um, all these little traumas, any from where from like, um, micro traumas, which, you know, I don't know if there's any real scale to trauma, but, you know, to intense things. So things like I knew what was going on with my friends' lives and they would either tell me or not tell me. But I was always someone who could talk about talk about the heavy stuff. I was always someone who could have those hard conversations, even from the time I was, you know, five, six, seven. I'm and I bounced around with my dad um, in the summer times because my dad used to live on native reserves. So I would go from native reserve to native reserve 
um, in the Chocolton Mountains by here. And so things like, you know, I would have grown people telling me their traumas and, and asking for my help in just not doing anything about it, but just someone to tell, just someone to talk to, just someone to move this kind of energy through. And, and so I look back and see that kind of stuff. And then things that, you know, would happen is like, I would know that things would ha- were happening before they'd happen. Um, my stepmom passed away when I was about 10. And when that phone rang, I just knew what was happening. And, and then, you know, having, being, a 10 year old going through a, the loss of a parent, um, a step parent, even, even though it was a step parent, the loss of a parent, and then having vivid dreams about how it happened, which was really brutal. She was hit by a truck outside and she froze on the ice. So on Valentine's Day. So like all these different kinds of things, these were just very um, specific examples of, of just the way that I was not necessarily the same as anybody else. Cause how do you explain that? Especially to a hyper Christian community <laughs> who, you know, yeah. would tell me that, you know, if you had a tattoo, it was the way for the devil to enter your soul. Not all of them are like that. And there, I lived in a really cool, um, beautiful community. And I'm still friends with a lot of those people, even though I haven't, um, I moved to the lower mainland, a big city when I was 13. So even beyond that, I've always been very creative. Creative minds tend to be very healing minds because creativity is a, a, an incredible way to heal. And so if you're a creative person, you you tend to be studying healing in, in totally different ways. So I, I was always a creative person. I was always weird. Like, I'm super weird. Like, I know that everybody's weird, but I'm a, an overt... <laughs> an extrovert who's like super weird who would like say weird things and do weird things just for shock value and to explore like I don't know what would it be like if I just started rolling across the floor (laughs) right like so just these weird little things uh, you must have got yourself into a lot of trouble then I suspect when you were younger I, I imagine that you were saying things that probably shouldn't have been said like, uh, did you know that blah, 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 and you would be telling people about something innerward that was going on, and yeah. they would be shocked. Yeah. Yeah, I've had, I had the same experience. So, so yeah, so an interesting childhood and, and an interesting place to grow up. I mean, you grew up in a beautiful, gorgeous, rugged, pristine uh, place in British Columbia. So for that, you must be truly grateful because I'm sure nature speaks to you in a very deep way coming from that area. It's one of my practices, actually. I realize, and I'm, I'm not 100% great at it, but if I don't get into nature at least weekly, like for a nice walk, that's why now, because we live in Vancouver, which is a big city now, but I live in North Vancouver, which is right by mountains, and I can go to trails, and we happen upon waterfalls. <laughs> We're like, oh, a waterfall, fantastic. And if I don't do that on a weekly basis, I get squirrely. There's three things that I need to do. I need to write, I need to get into nature, and I need to, um, and I need to do something creative like paint or draw or something like that. And those are the three things that I really need to do and practice for so that my soul doesn't get squirrely. And that's, it's a huge thing because I'm a, I'm such a nature baby. Like I call myself a fairy and it's totally true. (laughs) Like, you know, and it's true. Nature does speak to me and it clears me. And it actually also teaches me to be a healer because it shows like if I walk through nature and it just starts talking to me, not like actually talking, I can't hear it, but just these little things of like, this is how you clear energy. This is what you're holding on to. This is what it feels like when it falls off, like just little teachings. And I'm, I'm constantly being taught in that way. Um, by by nature by people by and and everything is a teaching opportunity for me as a healer because the way that you feel Mm -hmm. and how trauma lifts off your body and how heaviness lifts off your body so that we can literally enlighten is a teaching it's a mechanism of experience you have to learn what that feels like so that you can start i'm holding on to this i need to let it go you can understand when you need to take those ebbs and when you need to go into massive action for flow um, so that you can understand what your energy needs, what your body needs. And it's not a cut and dry thing for each person, right? Um, someone who's dealing with depression and anxiety is not the same thing as dealing with PTSD. And PTSD from something like sexual trauma is different than having PTSD from military trauma. It's it, There's so much right. 
incredible nuance in this world and everybody needs a specific practice. That's one of the biggest things that I do in my work is let's figure out what's going on. Let's figure out your out. So I, I was telling you, I, and, and I love it because I think that you and I have such similar things. It's just like, and, and this is not a new thing, but it's, I, I broke it down to three pillars so that people can understand that this is the work. So if you want to go off and do that work Before by yourself. You get into the pillars, let me, let me interrupt. You've said so many things yeah. that I'm so many things. So okay, fascinated sorry. about. That. I'll have to interrupt you because I know you'll go the full 45 minutes <laughs> and I won't get to ask you questions. And I want to Please ask you questions. So the first thing is, I love what you said about the three things that keep you grounded and connected to the earth plane. Really powerful. And thank you for reminding because the third one I don't do, and that's the creative. Mm-hmm. And I got it from just what you said. I said, oh, my God. I haven't allowed myself to do that for years. That's when I knew I was connected to source. That's when time ceased to exist. That's when I was in sacred space. So I thank you, Kat, for that blessing and reminding me about that part of myself. The other thing about a nature, I agree with you, I've got to be in nature. You've got to do that to be. The other thing I wanted to highlight, which is a real point or tip or hot spot or whatever, when you're listening to this show about the fact that you need to, if you could possibly know what it is to be in that state of grace, one with all that is, whether it's in nature, whatever, that's your touchstone to allow you to know when you need to clear yourself or whether you need to meditate or go into nature because that's that feeling tone. That's the original note you want to find during the day. And if it's not there, Please go find it. So I interrupted you because those were really amazing things that you were saying. So back to you, you got three pillars. I appreciate that because, yeah, I tend to run <laughs> run off in my mind. Um, yes, my, like so the three pillars that I tell everybody to work with is what you need to figure out for a balanced life is, one, you need to give time into what do you want your life to look like. So creating that vision. And and Evan and I, my husband and I have a, a, our own business where we are going into businesses and starting to create this. We also work with actors. Um, <laughs> we've got this dynamic thing happening. Um, so, but giving yourself permission in the time and all of this is a process and all the processes are always evolving, even including your passion and your purpose. So your purpose is not ever a one place thing your passion is not necessarily always a one place thing it's always a process it's always always evolving so the first thing is what do you want your life to look like seriously sit down and really think about it and and don't worry about you know and you have to navigate the fields of that's never going to happen i can't do that where is this going to come from blah 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 blah. you know you have to certain you have to give yourself permission to dream big with no limitation so that you can actually sit there and go, what do I want my life to look like? And then start understanding that you can get there and the steps along the way, everything might shift and change and move. And sometimes it doesn't, it goes exactly the way that you want it to and you create everything in your life that you want. And it's better than you've ever been, but you have to actually sit down and, and you have to imagine it, which is taking it from your higher self, your 10th dimensional self. You have to give yourself permission to tap into your higher self and what do, what do we want? What's our purpose here? What's our life path? What makes me so joyful, happy, everything I wanna do, be, have, and then you have to pull it through see it in your third eye then you have to pull it through into the third dimension which is rooting it and that's why writing something down is so powerful because you've literally just pulled it through your higher dimensional selves and put it tangible into our 3d world so that's the first step the second pillar is what's blocking you so your outer world your inner world sorry um Uh, So what's blocking you? What are these belief systems, this shame game, this doubt, these traumas, this depression, this anxiety? What would it feel like if that was gone, if that was dissolved? And teaching people how to, like you said, tap into that tone where everything is possible. But you have to keep moving through and navigating those fields. And then the third thing, and then in in that also creating a practice to do that whatever your practice looks like every day I get up and meditate for 20 minutes, or um, I go into nature for 20 minutes a day and walk, or I sing or I dance or I write or, or every time that this 
this energy pops up, I take a moment for myself and I clear it right in that moment. And then I continue on with my day, whatever that looks like, but you have to create a practice for yourself. And then it's energy. So this is where my healing technique comes in, where I do energy work and energy healing, where we clear all that out of your energy fields. We pull back those layers and we see what comes to the surface. We pull back those layers and we see what comes to the surface. We also clear pain because if you don't feel good, if your body is in pain, you know, so I can tell people like, what would it feel like if you did not have that hip pain, if you didn't have um, painful periods, if you didn't have those headaches anymore, if you didn't have that sinus stuff, that digestion issue, um, those body aches, you know, you know that you'd feel amazing. So we have to work inner world, outer world, and your energy. And that creates a really well working vessel. <laughs> wow. You said so much in such a short period of time at the three pillars. Um, I really liked what you were, you were saying. Very, very powerful. You know, most of us uh, human beings will spend mo most of our time talking about what we don't want. <laughs> or the struggle in our life or found um, the senior citizens home saying, well, I have this diagnosis or that diagnosis or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what would it be like if we were able to spend more time focused on what we do want than what we don't want, which is really what you're teaching people what to do. You've just given the three basic principles of manifesting anything and everything that you want in your life. Yeah. By pulling it down through yeah. your crown shocker, like you said, you just gave the whole formula away. So if you're listening to this show, you just got a short course in how to manifest. Just follow exactly what Kat said, and you can manifest anything that you want into reality. And guess what? If you don't ask, you don't receive. So thank you for that. That was really, really powerful. And we're obviously stirring some stumps out there because um, – Barbara says, uh, that's great to hear Kate creatively keeps the mind flowing and not being stagnant. Yeah. So that's why I interrupt her every once in a while. So thank you for that. <laughs> and and there's hi from Barb. So anyway, just to let you know, there's people out there paying attention. You've got some interest going on here. So continue on. So these three pillars are what you help um, with your clients, right? You teach them how to apply that into your life. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. And then, absolutely. And then, um, we all have our, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting distracted because I'm echoing. Um, I, we all have our own gifts, right? So, um, I actually tend to spark and awaken people's master manifester. And I was just reminded of this yesterday because of a woman that I had two sessions with. And I, I don't even remember when these were. They were last year sometime. I think they were, I think they were last year. Um, it, almost exactly this time. So she posted this thing and said, and her name is Kelly. I, I, this is public, so she's probably okay that I say this. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, if you're not, I apologize, but I think you will. So she posted this post that she just got to over six figures, 110K. And she said that it was right after we, we talked. And she said, I had like this piece. And I just said, you need to be offering this. And she said, three weeks later, she was starting to make 10K and it never stopped. <laughs> or 10k or or the the money that she was making and then just continued revving up from there i don't know if that was the 10k month but i know that with um the, the like week after we had our first session she made like thirty five hundred dollars you know and then and then we had another session and then yeah she went up to she just made a, over 100k and and that's happened before too like i had another client named jordan who manifested her you know dream clients and like right after our conversation i was like you should be working with these people Boom, it happened, and now she she's not even working with those people anymore. She's actually becoming the COO of a multi-million dollar um, spiritual business. So I just like these things happen all the times with my clients, <laughs> and I and I love that. So so knowing oh, so really quickly, this is just what kind of came into me recently too, because there's this huge thing, as you know, as your coach in the field too, where people get results or people don't get results, right? And a lot of that is based on alignment with your coach and alignment with what you're doing and belief in what you're doing. And what I've realized is that you really have to choose a coach that somewhat does what you want to do. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. I've been realizing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
Yeah, absolutely. You got to be on the same wavelength. Uh, we just had this conversation with my brand new coach this morning, as a matter of fact, in which I said, you know, I've, I've worked with some of the best, Lisa Stasevich, Christian Michelson, and Jay Fissett. I've learned their techniques, right? And graduated from their, you know, I'm a certified whatever type yeah. of coach, you know, extraordinary and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But they don't talk, those methods don't talk to me. Those are not my methods. That's not how I show up on planet or me. And I'm so excited to have a coach who understands me and my business and wow. is right there with me to help me in the next step to remove the, a block, whether it be an emotional block, psychological or spiritual, about why I can't make the next step. Now, I know this is no different. We're talking about a business, but this could be your life, the same thing. So absolutely, Kat, you're, you're spot on. You, when you look for a coach or a mentor, you need to be at the same frequency, the same attunement as them. It has to feel right for you. Other path and different ways to arrive at the same success, if success is in dollars or whatever you want to interpret it, there's many ways to um, to get there. So mm -hmm. having a coach like Kat is important because she's going to tailor make the program for you. That's the difference between a, that and a set formula uh, that is sort of like most of the set formulas out, out there are like uh, finding uh, in a school of fish the big fish. Yeah. So it's like trying to cast the net with a program to catch everybody. That's not what Kat and I do. We tailor make it for you, the client, for you, the person, to help get you out of your own way so you can show up and be the best you can, so you can deliver your gifts, gifts to the world. So I'm excited about the, what you're talking about and how you get at the course that you're going to teach people, blah, 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 blah. So you can see I can get very excited, and I can feel this 45 minutes too. So I'm going to be quiet and give it back to you. No, but I, I really appreciate that. I like that. I like fun conversations, so it's good. <laughs> um, yeah, like um, the other thing that I've been seeing, and I don't know why I want to touch on this. It's just coming through. So uh, the other thing that I've been seeing in the coaching field is there's a couple things. People are like, you're not getting results because you're not working hard enough. I don't agree with that. I believe that you will work and your coach will be able to find the way that you work and be able to get you to do the work that you need to do to shift. And it might not look like the work that they that another coach wants you to do all this stuff, right? So that's results oriented as well. So if you're not getting results, it's not because you're not doing the work. It might be because you're half-assing some work, but it's actually because you're not in alignment with that coach. <laughs> so right. that's one thing. And then the second thing is I hate, this is what I, I've been hating is like, Oh, well, if you're not getting the results, then maybe you're just not cut out to be a coach. I really don't like that because I feel like the online world has gotten really weird and snooty and they pretend like it's this easy, simple thing. And I actually don't believe in that. I believe that if you're meant to be a coach, you're meant to be a coach. But if you're on the online world and not getting results, you might not be meant to be online. <laughs> and I think that's one big thing that that coaches actually aren't addressing. If they're an online coach, they're teaching people how to be online. But if you're a coach, you actually need to teach people how to do the things that they need to do best. Like, so for myself, like, I actually don't work the best online. I work best in workshops and in-person things. And that's how I get a lot of results and a lot of joy and interest in things. I need to be in person. And so I know that for myself, like an online strategy probably just isn't really going to work no matter what I do. So I use online for enjoyment and connection and getting in touch with people. And sometimes I offer stuff. But for the most part, like you're either going to come across me or I'm going to work with you in a workshop and we're going to become client like client. But that's how I get my clients. So it's fascinating. Um, just these different dynamics that are happening. But I know that because I know, like, I, I've been watching lots of your stuff now. And we're kind of, you know, you and I are in this this um, this group of, like, no, it's, it's time for us as a humanity to be better. It's time for us to stop buying into these old systems. S saying to somebody, hey, by the way, I know you think this is your dream, but it's probably not your dream, is a terrible thing to do. And, and it's also buying into an old system of money, of economy this way, and instead of dream creation for a brand new great world, right? It's like people saying like, yes. well, how do you not use oil? Like we have used oil for everything or gasoline for everything. And I'm like, yes. 
but why are we still investing in these industries that we know are going out? <laughs> the point is that we don't want that anymore. So why aren't we learning how to be more sustainable? I know that you love the subject. Sustainable or community, mm-hmm. you know, we want communities, like we want connection. It's like, why aren't we? And I love this is all towards like, let's start focusing on what we want. We have done so many things in the focus of what I don't want. I don't want a broken family. I don't want a a terrible government. I don't want this. I don't want that. And so we grasp at straws, but it's like, yeah, but sit down and create. What do you want? (laughs) Why does that bug you so much? How do you be more positive? How How do you see someone's situation with compassion? How do you lovingly say, you know, I'm sorry, you're having a really hard time. What do you think the lesson is here? And how do you, what's right. the of this lesson? All right. <laughs> yeah, how do you turn the corner? Yeah. Well, I don't know how you learned how, how, who I am and how I show up in the world and even use my find it uh, really exciting the, how much we're off, we are on the same page and how we're approaching coaching in a very, very similar way. And I think that the important thing for anybody in this call is that while you may not want to be, what would you say, uh, on the internet or doing it, you're going to get clients just from this interview because people are going to see your enthusiasm, are going to feel your energy, and they're going to say, sir. And that's how I get my clients. This is an opportunity for people to feel you, who you are. And it's not so much what you say or what I say that's so important. It's that vibrational match between you and the person listening to you and say, that person resonates with me. So it's, that's the marketing. This marketing is you showing up being you and being mm-hmm. authentic so people can find you. And mm-hmm. so the, the tip in this is if you're, if you're out there listening to this show and you know that you're up against some sort of glass wall and you're, and you can't, in your business or in your life, then we really encourage you to go find a coach. And the first thing we want you to do is find an energetic match with whoever it is, whether it's a, a cat or whether it's a Tyson or whether it's somebody else, but find that energy match because they're going to help you get from where you are to where you want to be in the shortest amount of time. So, Another thing that came to my mind when you were talking about your background, and I'm just curious, and that is you were, your dad was uh, living and working around First Nations. So what sort of influence did that have on your life? It, uh, I actually had a lot of healing around that, um, which happened because my brother, my brother is half native and he still has lots of connection with his native family. Um, but after my stepmom died and um, she was the native half of my brother, we had different moms. Um, I was just kind of like, I felt like this is still my family and I wasn't treated like that because I wasn't related to any native person. And so I mean, that's not a big deal. That's that's actually probably just a community thing in any kind of nature. Uh, <laughs> and and I have to be honest, like my dad's not the most well-loved person sometimes. <laughs> um, my dad himself is, my dad himself has addiction issues and has had, um, has been an addict my whole life. So in, in that environment, like such I mean, I don't know (laughs) that your experiences make who you are, but I think fundamentally no person is very different. It was so much fun on, on the native communities. I have to tell you, like it is such a cool lifestyle as a child because uh, you know, they're not, they don't like, 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 you know, in that community. And it's the same as when I grew up and maybe it's just the difference of time, who knows, but we're not watched as kid kids. None of us were watched. We just would be like, all right, what do we want to do? And we would run around for hours. Our parents wouldn't know where we were at all. <laughs> and especially in Chill Colton's, oh my gosh, it's gorgeous. It was just, and I was such a curious being, right? So that I, I would literally, I, one time I walked across mountains for hours and hours. And, and this was a, sometimes a problem when I was like a kid, cause I'd just like go off, but I was just like, oh my gosh, there's cacti here. And I just followed cacti across this whole mountain range one time when I was like, you know, seven years old, hours, hours upon hours, you know, I'd just be gone. Or me and my brother would just, you know, we'd we'd grab a bunch of bottles and we'd go and get candy and then we'd just go play with our friends. And 
and you know we would just explore explore the area explore uh, you know play explore nature explore and um, my dad eventually moved to Bella Coola this was when I was a little bit older in my late teens and you go down to Bella Coola like you walk into any kind of like beautiful mountain and you're going to see ruin like you're going to see carvings and you're going to see you know the, the cool things about that that community and um, the hard part is understanding how horribly they're treated you know and growing yeah, so yeah and so for me like going through this whole thing of of like forgiving myself and understanding deeply and feeling the love that I have for that community and then relearning all the stuff because I kind of was just like, Oh, when, when that cut off, I cut off myself from, from them, from that community. And except for my brother, of course, he's awesome. He's amazing. <laughs> but it was an interesting thing as I learned this in my late twenties when I was like, Oh my God, I've got so much love for that community and relearning about um, you know, even things like the, like the school, like the schools, I forget what they're called. The, uh, oh, I'm the schools that they were put into. Right. And the last one that, yeah. uh, do you remember what they're called? Um, yeah, yeah, I could slip in my mind too, but I've gone and cleared them and, um, yeah, it's horrible situation that they were in. Yeah. Like uh, just the last one closed in the late nineties. Like people don't understand that this is not just like, this is people who are in their twenties who still went to them and the pain and the suffering. And I've come across filmmakers who have really attacked this issue, which I think is phenomenal. But when you're sitting there listening to someone who has healed from this, because a lot of people don't, but meeting someone who was able to use their art for a bit of healing, obviously there's so much rage still. But when you hear that someone was in a school and they didn't even know that their sister was across from them for years and they hadn't seen their siblings and they were being beaten and raped and almost drowned. And, and that like in the, be in the beginning when these schools opened, 90% of the kids died and their parents didn't even know. Eventually it was 50 and then, but it was still like 50, like this is insane. This is insane what, what happened. And I think that people don't understand the depths and the gravity of that. And so. No, I, I agree with you. It's horrible. Yeah. Uh, I grew, I grew up uh, around Dukabar nation, uh, Dukabar people. And the same thing happened with them is they were put into the, the same type of schools taken out of their families. They were promised when they came to Canada that they didn't have to go to war and then they could keep their own religion, and then yeah. they could own their land communally. Yeah. And we, as a government, reneged on every one of those, yeah. stuck their kids in school, put them, you know. Anyway, so, you know, as Canadians, our legacy in treating Indigenous people and people from other cultures is pretty horrific. Well, that my, being other, said, my other culture, just really to jump in here, is I'm actually quarter Japanese as well. So my grandma herself was in internment camps in Vancouver. <laughs> so, like just all this energy, right? So lots of clearing down right. ancestral lines, <laughs> lots of clearing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess, Kate, Kat, that really makes you really have um, a great deal of, of compassion for those that are have to deal with addiction and have to do with trauma that comes from their lineage and from their background. You must have a sensitivity and ability to help people in a very deep, transformative way. It, that's actually, that's, it's a huge part of my business. It's the people that are attracted um, and, and that I work the best with because I know how to clear trauma and depression and anxiety very well. I hold a very sacred space around these things. Uh, it, it always, no matter who you are as a coach, who, if you're looking for coaching, you always have to be ready to want to make that shift. It doesn't mean that it's going to be simple or easy, but you have to be ready and willing to start looking and, and not a psychology way. I'm not a psychologist. Coaching is such a beautiful thing because it's it's reframing mostly. Right. So it's reframing and then energy for me, energy healing. And I I'm very, very I'm very good with those lines because I come from a healthcare background and I don't want to overstep my boundaries. And I have no problem saying you need to go to a psychologist when it comes to this. Um, but yeah, I do hold space for people who 
are ready. So, you know, if you're watching this and you are ready, you're on that way to like, you're ready to clear this trauma, you're ready to clear depression, anxiety. I've been through that, you know, I had depression, I had anxiety, I've worked through having a trauma in my life, my own personal life, um, growing up in a traumatic, you know, household with all these different kinds of little, little and big traumas, and then holding space for a lot of people who also had trauma since I was a child. So I tend to work. So if you're ready, um, reach out to me. Um, yeah. It, do you, do you work a lot of that? So do um, I don't, I'm like, was that like my grandpa's Russian and his family came here from Russia. Is that the Dukovors, right? <laughs> In trail? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. They were, um, they refused to bear iron arms. Um, and, uh, therefore had to, and because they're pacifists and, yeah. you know, it's like they're bread, the staff of life is bread and water and salt and they're pacifists. And, um, and not wanting to bear arms, they had to leave because they were being persecuted. Right. The irony of this is that because of the way they were treated, they also became terrorists. So there was the Sons of Freedom and the Duke of Bar Squad was created by the RCMP. So I grew up in a community where uh, my best friends were Duke of Bar. Uh, they were connected to the land. They grew gardens. They were, they, they were the salt of the earth. They were so connected to nature and they could grow anything. They were amazing and, yeah. and very much community. Uh, they lived communally. So the whole idea of living communally was part of that as well. But there was also this violence uh, of the anger and resentment of having been betrayed. Uh, they became terrorists and you know, they would blow up power lines. So when we went to school, we would never, we would know something had happened because all the Duke of our kids wouldn't talk about what would happen. So mm -hmm. one of the most violent ones was uh, we went to school uh, to find out that one of the kids had dynamite in the back of a car and it went off in, in his lap. So that was my background, though, full of violence and full of radicalism and full of, uh, of understanding what it is if you don't want to fit into the society societal structure mm -hmm. or with, or with, yeah, anyway, so it a background similar to yours where I have an incredible compassion and understanding for those that are, what would we say, resisting the status quo that are here as part of the planetary cleanup crew that are here to bring about a new way of being on planet Earth who can help themselves because that's who they are. And, you know, if you're listening to this interview, you know who you are. Yeah. And, uh, it resonates with you. You just found your tribe. And I really encourage you to reach out because it's only by finding like-minded people like us that you can join hands with, link arm to arm, that you can have the courage to show up and be all that you can be so we can make this a much more peaceful, pleasant, beautiful planet to live on. And I'm back in taking over this whole thing, and I'm going to give it back to you. But, yeah, we very, very similar. The, the trauma... Well, it has tested us and gave us the ability to work with others. We don't want anybody else to have to go through this. This is like to have to learn on planet Earth. We're all about ease and grace and going with the flow and teaching people how to do that. Yeah, well-being, right? Not working from yeah, well-being. You know, I love I love everything that you just said, and and it's fascinating because I like my grandpa grew up like that and <laughs> and in I think in trail I keep getting it all confused in my head but one big thing that people also forget about the Duke of Bors, if because they came from uh, Russia pacifist um very mind your body was a temple um my grandpa who's about yes. eight was the first generation in that line to drink so it, it's just like the native culture where that first line, you don't have the enzymes. So that, so like so many people became alcoholics or got diabetes because of this um, introduction of alcohol and things like that in, in a body and a, and a lineage that never touched it. <laughs> so it's very interesting how all our addictions. Um, that's another thing that I, I love t talking about is addiction, right? Because when we talk about addiction, so many people think drugs and alcohol, but addictions, actually, some of the worst addictions that we have are media and sugar. <laughs> like, they're the ones that will yes. take 
the normal people out of the game of playing big, of feeling good, of using your time in a way that really feeds your soul. And, and not that I don't love TV myself and I don't love sugar. I do. I love both. But I have a very clear understanding that I have a total addiction to them. And so I have to manage those addictions. Um, and it's just like drugs and alcohol and other things. And people just see it as different different things, right? And it's just because we were taught this. We're a society that's taught to like to watch TV and eat a bunch of sugar. And that's what makes us feel good. But I think that people don't understand how actually bad their bodies feel sometimes when, you know, they don't get onto nature. And that's why I always say this practice of get into, like for me, it's get into nature, writing and something creative. So I either dance or I uh, paint. And if I don't do that on a weekly basis, then I, yeah, my, my soul, like I just feel, and when I say my soul gets squirrely, it means that I feel like I'm going back into a uh, depressive pattern. I feel like I'm lethargic. I feel like um, my world can fall apart because we know that with depression patterns, it's like nothing's ever going to work, right? My anxiety Mm -hmm. gets up, these different things. So I actually can manage things like all these things. And, and dance actually is a way for me to clear things. Like you said, when you, you know, you were saying that you cleared a lot of, um, of the, that native population stuff. I've done that too. And, and it's interesting because it just flows through you. Something pops into your head for the collective consciousness to clear and just flows through you. And I move that through dance for me. Um, yeah. So like, I think that's, I don't know, we're just getting back into our light leader bodies, right? We're really just connecting with our our higher dimensional selves. We've lived in the third dimension too long. Um, the, the growing pains are in the fourth dimension so that we can get to the fifth dimensional consciousness. That's, that's another way that I see it. I don't know if that was <laughs> really like, too much. Yeah, the, the word that we were looking for before is residential schools is residential. what we were talking about is yes, yeah, where they round up the kids and take them out of the families and stick them in a school where they can't speak their native language. They have to learn English and where they get, uh, you know, inculcated with with religious beliefs and all the rest of that. And like you said, this is still was going on until quite recently. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm, yeah. I, for me, I was blessed in that my, um, my um, indigenous grandmother who adopted me uh, was, she's from a residential school background. She's passed on uh, to the other side. But when we were working together, she had the ability to forgive like no woman on earth that I can imagine. You know, she, she believed that we had to come together despite everything that happened to heal our wounds. And so that's what she worked on. Beautiful. And it was really powerful. Every time we uh, were in an indigenous gathering or, or where she spoke, I could go around in the room and know who she had taught or who, who was um, understood her because they would speak in a different way. They talk about, unity they talk about cult, bridging cultures and traditions and and i i think that's the next step is that there are some of us that have had this experience of bridging two worlds yes first nations and Dukabor and this world and we're ready and willing to do that bridge work again we just need to be recognized that because we don't come with a first nation skin right doesn't mean that we don't have that in our soul doesn't mean that we don't have the knowingness of this doesn't mean we can't walk the path with them and help do the healing so if you're of mixed race or if you're a first nations and you understand what we're talking about that's another way that i think that both i can only speak for myself but i'm pretty sure that you that would excite you to work on that level as well is that right yeah, absolutely. I love working with um, like all cultures, of course, because it's an interesting thing. Um, and I talk about it a lot, being um, in a Japanese Canadian family and being a white woman, right? So, and and having a multicultural family. Uh, my brothers, like, I have lots of disability, um, autism, mental disability in my family. My sister's adopted from Guatemala. My brother's black. Um, half black, um, and my uh, and these are these were adopted into our family, and then um, and then uh, yeah, working with my my siblings who have autism, who are also adopted into our family, um, plus the native side and the Japanese side, and it's 
It's interesting because there's so many things that I cannot speak on. I cannot speak on being treated as if I look like I'm Japanese or anything like that. I I never have felt um, uh, any kind of like anything against that. That's where I just got into this whole conversation this week about this, where it's like, this is where we need to actually listen to the people uh, who are having trouble, like, or or, are getting these things happening to them. Does that make sense? (laughs) Or have the perspective of having uh, or of feeling like they don't belong or having people ask them where they're from every day when they're Canadian or American or something like that, just because of their skin color. That's something that I can't talk on, but can I talk on how, yeah, the bridging the gap thing. I love that you said that because I think that everybody's gift is where they bridge that gap. The fact is, is that I have family who are Canadian Japanese and they talk to me about this kind of stuff. So I hear their perspective and I, and it, and I can't do anything, but it pisses me off. I also have, you know, my Obachan, my grandma, who is absolutely phenomenal, but she is like the epitome of like 1950s, you know, housewife and her sisters are too, because when they came here, they just had to assimilate. They wanted to be Mm -hmm. like, so, you know, and it was the 19, my grandma was born in 1930 in the 1930s. So like when she was coming into teenagehood and adulthood, it was the 1950s and 60s, right? So just assimilating, assimilating. And um, she even told me one time, don't tan your skin because white is in. And I was like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and I'm like, not yeah. that I can tan at all anyways. I think we can all see that. I'm, I'm not a tanner. <laughs> But yeah, like just little things is like, where, this is something that I love uh, because uh, where do you bridge the gap? Cause I hear it all the time. My, my sister's a coach as well. And she does, um, she, she's a sexual empowerment coach, which I think is fascinating and beautiful work. Um, her name is Natasha Weep. <laughs> and so anyway, she bridges the gap in, in t- having those hard conversations around sexuality and teaching people how to get into their sexuality and also around things like sexuality as in like feminine sexuality, masculine sexuality, um, and, and how to have the conversations around it in, in not just um, sex, but sexuality, right? So right. all these things that are, but anyways, uh, so where, I love asking these pe- people these questions because where do you bridge the gap? That's where we all are unique, right? Like Duke of native, um, and then we're, uh, you know, and then Ascension and, and all the stuff that you've done with sustainability and creating community and all these kinds of things. Those are sp- so specific to you. That now you can you'll find those bridges to make. Oh, you know, if you did this, mm-hmm. we could fix this, and you pull from everything that you've experienced, right? So this is something that I love speaking on: is diversity, equality, um, and because it it's such a part of who I am, because my whole family is diverse. And, and we all treat each other as equals and we love each other just the same. Like, and, and we feel each other's pain when things happen and, and we try and fix it for each other when, when we can. Right. So it's like bridging this gap of, and it's, where do you bridge that gap? Those, these are where some of your beautiful, most beautiful gifts lie. It's like, what has your experience been and how can you connect two different worlds so that we can unify things? Because yeah. Because we separate, right? You're this, you're that, we're this. Yeah. We're th- and it's like, no, nah, now it's let's bridge this, let's bridge that, let's bridge this. Because I think for most people, we have an understanding. We don't have an experience, but we have an understanding that we're one. We have a unity consciousness. And they're figuring this out even in science, that we have the self-consciousness and then we have the full consciousness. And for some, some reason, the collective consciousness, uh, we're creating our world together. And they're proving this in science, which has been proven in, you know, mystics forever. (laughs) But this is a great thing for someone in the audience right now listening. Where do you bridge your gap? So little random things like for me, like grew up around native reserves and in that community around the Japanese Canadian culture um, and being, you know, really intuitive, uh, being an extrovert, you know, and then going massively into introversion when I went into my dark night of my soul with depression and anxiety, um, having a father with addiction, like where are the places that you know you've healed from and you can bridge the gap 
between healing these different things, right? And bringing us all together. <laughs> Did I explain that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. So, so we've got an echo here. Being the wounded warrior, you don't have to be the wounded warrior in order to be a healer, but in our growing up, and we were really blessed that we did have all these experiences. Yeah. Just to show you the similarity, um, my brother is part Japanese, uh, mixed race, <laughs> and also my sister is mixed race, and she's part Negro. My brother is married into a full-fledged um, um, Italian family, so there's the Italian mixed in with the part Japanese, so it's really, and I was just at his daughter's wedding. It was really interesting to sit at the table with the, um, the very, very uh, uh, staunch um, family from uh, from Italy, the Italian, right? They have, definitely family is key to them. So yeah. it was really, really fascinating to be part of that. So now we had the Japanese meeting the Italians. Uh, yeah, it was, you know, and so it continues. But these are the bridging that we need. This is uh, the way that we achieve our oneness is understanding that our uniqueness is in the diversity and God bless the diversity. It allows us to show up in so many different colors of the rainbow. It makes us uh, so vibrantly, uniquely different. Yeah. So I know we're very close to uh, being able to wrap this up as a show. We've nearly been about a, almost close to two to an hour, yeah. <laughs> but you know, we could go on forever. I could but go I just want to, uh, yeah, I just want to thank uh, the opportunity to, to be with you and to talk about things that are really dear to my heart and find, Kate, that you're on the same page. It's been a true blessing. So yeah, uh, one you. more time, for those that have been listening in, let's let them know how, what sort of things that you would love to do, what sort of people, what's your tribe, who, who do you want to work with? Can you just say that one more time and then we'll put up your website uh, so people can get hold of you. Yeah, so my tribe are um, visionary women, visionary light leaders who are wanting to step into this next level identity, move through their depression, anxiety, and trauma to have the massive impact that they know they're meant for in this world. So that's the biggest, that's, that's who I work with, is you have a massive vision and you are, I, I'm kind of a, a you push you over this this threshold so that you can step into the next level identity because we have to step into who we see ourselves as in our highest light and i am a genius at bringing people there because i have um, a coaching healthcare um, background and a performance background so that's who i really work with um and women women mostly but i have worked with men before who've gotten really cool results as well so that's my tribe, but really, like, I just love connecting with people. So anybody who wants to connect, reach out. You can find me at katschulte.com, K-A-T-C-H-U-L-T-E.com. It's right there in the comments. And so that's that's me. And um, I just want to leave people with, yeah, just on the, the end of this crazy, amazing conversation I've had is I think the most beautiful thing we can do is learn from each other's experiences. Find your mentor. Find who you need to work with to get you to that next level uh, any way that you can. And then continue to work on your vision of your of what you want your life to look like. Break that down into tiny steps of what you can do to, to take action towards that. Figure out what's stopping you. Just write it out. That voice, that ugly voice, what is it saying inside your head? What's your practice to counteract that voice and clear that energy and work on your own energy? So those are the things that I want to leave everybody with. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> It was a pleasure talking with you, and I'm sure we'll meet again and carry on the conversation. Um, thank you ever so much. It was a great uh, interview. I, I learned lots, shared lots, and hopefully everybody out there and had a, uh, something that they could learn and take away from this. And you know how to get all of us if you want to work with us. And so bye for now. Thank you, Tyson. Thank you. <laughs> bye, everybody. All right. Blessings. For quality online wellness products, courses, and services, visit our sponsors, thewellnessstore.ca.
and the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy located at thewellnessacademy.ca. To stay in touch, visit us at thewellnessshow.ca. And until next time, be healthy, wealthy, and wise.